morning and welcome to Purpose for Life Ministry. We are so glad that you invited us into your home this morning. Please join the pastor and I as we declare that Jesus is Lord and God is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. He is. We're so glad about it. Amen. Amen. So would you join us as we affirm our faith because we truly believe what we're saying out of our mouths. And we pray that you are too, and looking forward that too, the things that you're saying will come true. So this is the day that, that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day we're going to be a blessing to God and to others. This is the day we're going to be victorious over anything that the world or the devil brings our way. This is the day we're going to be fruitful and effective in everything that we put our hands to do. This is the day we're going to have peace that the world didn't give us and the world can't take it away. This is the day we will be healthy from the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. And finally, this is the day we're going to let go and let God have his way. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my sister. Hallelujah. All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, and before we get started, I always like to say when we have an announcement, uh, next week we will be uh, uh, partaking communion. So whoever wants to join us, even though it's on YouTube, even though it's recorded, I always say start now in preparation. So place your wafers or whatever you're going to eat, bread or however way you're going to do the, the, the bread part and the juice part separate from all the other wafers or all the other juice that's in a bottle or whatever. Empty it out, put it aside, don't drink out of that for anything other than what we're going to do with communion. Amen? We'll consecrate it next week and you can join us as we do that. Uh, because that is Memorial Weekend, so that's, that's really a, a perfect time for us to do it. Amen? Amen. All right. Turn with me to the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Bible. Amen? Amen. And we're going to read verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Three verses, but they're powerful verses, and it speaks about the history of creation. And then I want to look at the King James Version of one verse. But right now, I'm reading from the New King James Version. So beginning in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 4, it reads like this. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before any plant of the field was in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Our key verse is number seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We've already... Uh, and invocated and invoked the presence of the Lord in here through prayer. So let's get right into the teaching of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. And so you heard me say, I like to look at this translation in the New King James Version because in the New King James Version, one word is going to show and set our subject for this evening. The New King James Version in verse 7 reads like this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils mm -hmm. the breath of life. And here we go. And man became a living soul. You see the, you see the difference of that word? Yeah. The other version, New King James Version, said man became a living being. And another version it says, and man became a living person. All of that really is indicated of man becoming a living soul. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we got life, but we got more than life. So, this deeper meaning that I just shared with you about the word soul gives us our subject. 
sold out because I'm sold out. Now, I want you, when you write that subject down, I want you to write sold out, S-O-U-L-E-D, out. Soul, like your soul, out, sold out, past tense, because I'm sold, S-O-L-D, because I'm sold out, okay? We're going to okay. look at that and how that okay. uh, impacts this teaching that we're going into. Because this deeper meaning of going from just saying, ah, you know, the Lord breathed into our nostrils and uh, uh, gave us life, which is good, amen? Because with amen. life, you end up getting... Uh, uh, joy and you have the pleasures of, 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 of being in the world where you can enjoy uh, the different things that God has blessed on this planet. You know, we can talk, we can communicate. We got a lot of things going on just by living. Amen? Yeah. But that has nothing to do with your soul. See, that's just the benefits of you having life. But when he says, after that, not only did I give you life, he said, and then man became a living soul. So he's tying your soul also with life. Not just life and not just soul. One's going to affect the other. Not life is going to affect the soul. The soul, S-O-U-L, will affect your life depending on whether you're sold out, which we'll get a little bit more into mm -hmm. that. Amen? Okay. So if we were born of God, if God breathed into us the breath of life and and then he created and put in us a soul. He gave us. It was God who yes. gave us mm -hmm. this soul. Now, this soul is unique. Okay? But if he gave us that soul, wouldn't it make sense that when we get born again and we say, Lord, I surrender all, what are you surrendering? You're surrendering your life, your heart, your soul, your strength. Your mind, your body. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us the Lord, to love the Lord your God with what? With all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? Withholding nothing. I don't know whether we were, we understood that at the time that we surrendered, what that means, but hopefully by the end of this message, you will. Amen? Amen. Being sold out is because God is saying today, once I gave it to you, I expected you to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. I expected you to be like me. I create, so I want you to create. But when you create, I want you to create the way I would create. Mm -hmm. See, God made us in his image, right? Amen. Now, I want to give this is a little side thing I want to give to you, though. But God made us into his, his image. Guess what his image is when it's referring to us? God deals with threes and sevens and twelves and all these numbers, but let's just talk about threes. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the will, God the word, God the work, which is the Son, Father, Holy Spirit. That's another mm -hmm. whole teaching, amen? Some of y'all have been listening to that and been getting that from Sister Yvonne, who has been uh, doing a teaching on that uh, with, with a, a few of you all out there. So I know you all know what I'm talking about, but those are threes too, right? And then let's look at how he created man. He created man in threes. We have a body, we have a spirit, and we have a soul. Amen. Let's look at the soul. The soul is made up of intellect, emotion, and will. Three, three, three. Everything is threes. Now you say, how is that God's image? Well, I just said he's the work, he's the will, and he's the way. I mean, he's the uh, work, the word, and the way, and the will. Right? Amen. That's it, right? The, the word, word, the work. And the, the will, the word, and yeah, the and the word, yeah, right, the three, and and so think about what we are. Now that we're born again, we have His word. The work is the spirit that's in us. The will is the part of the soul that He put in us, and He says, "Now you can operate with those three just like I operate." Okay, Amen. God has a soul. God is spirit, right? Amen. And 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 God is spiritually flesh. See, he, he's not flesh. He has a spiritual body. We have a fleshly body. He has a, a, a spiritual will. We have a worldly will until we surrender it to God. And we have a, uh, this, uh, a soul. God has a soul. He said, well, how do you know God has a soul? What did I tell you the soul is made up of? It's made up of intellect, 
Nobody knows beyond what, what, what's, what's, who can comprehend the mind and intelligence of God. It's past finding out. But he's intellectual. He knows everything, right? Okay. Uh, he's emotional. We know we've seen God get angry. <laughs> we've, seen, we've seen God where he destroys people because he's angry. Mm -hmm. But we also see him loving. These are emotions. We get angry. We got emotion made in his image, right? Yeah. And we have a will. God has a will. That's the, the thought. Jesus said, I only do what my Father's will. Not my will, Lord, but thy, God, thy will be done. We have a will. He made us to be like him. So that's a little side thing because when we get into being sold out and we start talking about the uniqueness and we start talking about the personalities, which I'm getting ready to go into now, it's because he made us to be a certain way and he gave us a soul so that we can produce what his plan and purpose is in this life. And we're without excuse, as you're going to see in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So being sold is because God took back what we gave him. Uh, when we surrendered, right? Mm -hmm. We gave him our mind, our soul, our strength, our, 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 uh, our body. He purchased my soul and your soul, I pray, if you already gave your life to him, uh, with the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. This was your payment. For a sinful life that he did. That he paid. By the blood. But now you're washed. You're saved. You're filled with God's spirit. Housed in your body. With your soul. You hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Your house. This is your house. Your body is your house. Your body is your temple. Your body is the place. where The flesh. Where your soul now resides in. Mm -hmm. And then God then comes into your body. That's why he calls our body the temple of the living God. We're going to look at that in a second. But again, it's like this flesh is not what God is concerned with as much as it is the soul. Right? Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians. And we're going to look at chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. And... My question to you is, are you sold out with me? So, are you giving God everything that has to do with your soul in his hands so that he is in control? That's what I'm talking about, sold out. I'm giving him everything. We're going to look at that in a little bit too. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse uh, 19 and 20 reads like this. Or do you not know that your body, your house, your, your temple is the temple of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. who is in you, right? Mm -hmm. Whom you have from God and you are not your own. Y'all hear this? Amen. See, when you gave your life to Christ, mm -hmm. you don't no longer have control over your body. You think you do. And when you start to disobey what God wants you to do, then yeah, you take control back from God. But that's not the way it's supposed to work. And the way it's supposed to work is if you were really serious when you gave your life to Christ, then you were submissive to God. And every time you tried to take and do your own thing, God would say if it's not in line with his will, he would speak to your heart and say, don't do that. Hold up. That's not where I want. Don't, don't go down that path because I got another path that I want you to go to. Now, you can still choose because your will, he's not going to violate your own will. So if you decide to go the wrong path, which some of us do, Amen. Then he'll let you. But there will be consequences. There won't be blessings. Okay? Even when I say consequences, I mean result, things that will happen as a result of you not obeying God when he's telling you to. Now, maybe you can't hear him. You know, maybe because it's, you've been, your heart's gotten a little hard and when he's trying to tell you don't go there, you might not can hear him as well. That's another whole teaching. But I'm talking about when you know you shouldn't go and you go then you're deciding, I want to take my soul back <laughs> for this moment, mm. and I want to do my own thing. All right? Let's keep reading. Verse uh, 20, because he says, you are not your own. He says, for you were bought at a price. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he says, this is what you should be doing. You should be glorifying God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, not yours. <laughs> okay? Now, that's a good thing. For all of us who are born again, we should be saying hallelujah, thank hallelujah. you, Lord. Because I know I can't make good decisions in my life that mm. is right 
for the, the, the masses. Because any decision you make is going to affect more than just you. You might think it's like, oh, I'm going to do this because this is good for me. Well, you do it, and then guess what? Somebody else is going to be impacted, good or bad, depending on the decision. See, your blessings can impact others, and your bad decisions and disobedience can also impact others. You're, it's not just for you, whatever the case is, whatever decision you make, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really important to understand that the soul that God gave us is housed in the flesh. And the flesh, again, is not what God is concerned about mo mostly. He's mostly concerned about your soul. And we're going to see a lot about that as we mm -hmm. move on. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, all right? Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to be 16 and 17, two verses there. Chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. And it reads like this. We have, okay, there we go. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Watch this. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward, excuse me, the inward man is being renewed day by day. God is saying, the things that your flesh is going to have to deal with is not going to be pleasant. Because as Paul says, I crucify my flesh daily. Like, my flesh would love to be in control over my soul. But I'm not having it, Paul says. And God says, as long as you, as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20, as long as you glorify God with your body and your mm -hmm. spirit and your soul, then you don't have to worry about uh, uh, the flesh being in control because your soul is surrendered to God and God is, is, a, is, is manipulating and maneuvering in you and through you, through your soul. Because remember, your soul is what make, determines the decisions that you're going to make in life. And we're going to look at that again too in a little while. But that's what the battle is between Satan and God. Mm -hmm. Who controls the soul? We're going to look at that a little bit and a little bit later. But let's keep reading. He says, uh, verse 17, mm -hmm. for your light affliction, he calls it light, <laughs> okay? He says, for your light affliction, this is the Apostle Paul, though, that's calling this, but it's, it's uh, given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So everything Paul's writing, God has given him to write. And he says, uh, for your light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Amen? Amen. He says, look, understand that whatever your flesh got to go through, whatever it is, pain, suffering, uh, heartache, you know, I mean, there's some sadness that we deal with in life just because we're human. Amen. But when you're surrendered your soul, when you gave all of your soul out to God and he starts to control how you like, like put little thoughts in your head because you're listening. Mm. Amen. Any any uh, uh, obstacle that comes your way, sickness, uh, heartache, uh, trials, persecution, anything that comes to you. In your face, the first thing you should do is look to God. Mm -hmm. The very first thing you should do is turn to God and say, God, what's going on? What do I do? Do I stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? Or do I make a decision based on what you want me to do now? Like, am I in the way at this moment and I should move over here and get out of the way and let this thing pass by? Or do I just have to endure some light affliction, which is just for a moment, according to the Apostle Paul, knowing that whatever I'm going through, if I don't act up and take my soul back from God and start to do my own thing, God says, I got this because it's going to produce in you an exceeding weight of glory. Mm. It's going to transform you, but it's going to glorify me. And isn't that what we want? To glorify God. Mm. Hallelujah. He says the outward man is perishing. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. Who you are on the inside of your house or shell. Or let me say it again. Who you are is what's on the inside of your shell or your house. Who you are. Not what you look like. All right. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't judge a person whether they're 
uh, 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 the appearance of people, whether they're fat, they're skinny, they're tall, they're short, they're good looking, they're ugly. Uh, you know, you go down the list on visual. We don't judge that. You, you shouldn't judge that. Now, I know we, we get caught up in that and say, oh, that person looks good. That man might be built or that woman might be stacked or whatever you want to say. That's not who they are. <laughs> okay? Amen. That's just the appearance of the flesh which is perishing. And if you don't believe that, you know, you start to get a little old, you start to get a little gray, you start to have some things going on, it's perishing. But your soul. That's why people say, man, I still feel young. Why? Not because of your, your outward appearance. It's because of what's on the inside. And because you've been feeding what's on the inside, your soul, with the word of God and allowing God, who you gave all your soul over to, mm -hmm. to just control you and, and direct you mm -hmm. and give you that joy and peace that the world didn't give it and the world can't take it. Amen. You can go to your grave, whatever that is, in peace. And having joy because guess what? The soul doesn't die. Your flesh will. But your soul is being renewed day by day. You hear what I'm saying? It's nothing. Well, when I say nothing, I'm talking about the flesh. It's nothing compared to the heart and soul that God has put in us. And that is who you are. And if you watch a person, and if you listen without interrupting, and let people just talk and talk and talk, eventually what's in them is going to come out. Their true nature is going to come out. See, what they see on the outside, what we see on the outside is what they want us to see. That's why we don't judge what we see. And we don't judge what people say right off the bat. Because they'll tell us what they want us to know, and they'll, they'll have us look at them and give accolades if that's what they want. Yeah, I'm not saying all people do, but some people get off on that. Mm -hmm. I got to have people tell me how good I am, how good I look, and never, never touch who I am on the inside. That's a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. So today, I want each of us to really give God praise and thank God mm -hmm. for creating us with life and uniqueness and such uniqueness that we know who we are. Let me just share this with you for, I'm talking about myself, all right? And I'm saying it in a way where I want you to grab hold and think about yourself. Because here's what I want you to know. I know my drive. I know my passion for God. I know the desires to please God. I know the determination to fight the good fight of faith. And I know what I need and what I love to do in serving the Lord. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. Guess what? And God knows it too. Yes, he does. Because all of that is what is really, what I'm saying is what's really in my soul. Yes. And when I say that, what God looks at is he's doing and operating, even though I'm flawed. Amen. Even though, Amen. you know, we Amen. all make mistakes. Yes. God's like, he's trying to live the life that I put him in him to live. Mm -hmm. So, I am sold out. Because I'm giving him everything that he shows me daily. So, okay, I gave him my soul. And we gave him, we, if you're born again, gave him our soul. We gave him our heart. We said, Lord, we surrender all, right? We sing that song, I surrender all. And then, do you realize what you're saying when you say that? <laughs> okay? Because what you're saying is that you, you ain't giving him the flesh. You're giving him what he wants most. And that is your soul. Right? Amen. And he will show you every day what it is that he wants today. See, we say we surrender all and we gave him our whole heart and soul and strength. But really, it's only moment by moment and day by day as he shows us what it is that today, this is what I need from you for the dog. And it's like, oh, okay, all right. I didn't even know I was holding on to that. But mm -hmm. now that you showed me that, yeah. it's yours, God. It's you hear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Look, turn with me. I want you to see. Well, actually, you don't have to go there because you all probably know this. Okay. Jeremiah 1.5. Just write that down. Jeremiah 1.5. It says it best. Jesus said, or God says, before I formed you, mm -hmm. I ordained you. I knew you. 
He says, before I formed you, mm. I knew you. Let me just add this. Before I formed you, Jeremiah, before you came out of your mother's womb, Jeremiah, before you were able to talk or walk, I set you apart. I ordained you. I predestined you for a work that he had placed in Jeremiah's. And I'm saying that's the same thing he's saying to us. Mm -hmm. Before he formed us in our mother's womb. See, God breathed into Adam after he made Adam out of the dust and he became a living soul. Mm -hmm. Our becoming a living soul is when God spiritually had already produced or, or had uh, uh, made us. It just hadn't manifested yet, but it was made in the spirit. That's why he says, before I formed you, I knew you. Mm. I had ordained you. I had set you apart. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, that's when we got our soul back from the spiritual, and then it manifested in the, in the natural. Mm. You come out as a baby, your soul is already there. You're, you're, of course, you got life, but I mean, your soul is already intact. Everything he had already planned for you in the spiritual is now here. Mm. And it's in you. And nobody else, there's no two people ever in the history of creation or will be in the history of creation that has the same soul. Twins, quadruplets, doesn't make a difference. Quintret, was it quintuplet? Quintuplets, when it's like nine of them. It's like, there, there's no two souls ever in creation. You might be twins or you might look the same, but you, you definitely have different personalities. You know, that, some twins don't even like to dress the same. You know, some, the parents do, but the, the twins to grow up and say, I don't want to have the same thing looking like her. I'm my own person. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. And so what I'm saying is God blessed us not only to have a soul, but in the soul, he placed us with gifts. Why? To make sure that we achieve his purpose. And it's all wrapped up where? In the soul, so, in the soul of man. Amen. Church, it's time to release all that God purposed in us. It's time to give our entire, entire soul over to the Lord. Soul out, give it all over to him, right? Mm -hmm. Withholding nothing. Look, isn't that what we said at the, at the altar or wherever you are when you gave your life over to Christ? And you heard me say earlier, were we serious? Or did we even understand what we mm. were saying when we did that? If you didn't, I pray today you now know that when you surrender to God, what you were saying is, I'm giving you all of me. Everything that's in me, I'm giving it over to you, Lord. And you control me now. Jesus, you are Lord. That means you have the supreme authority to do whatever you want to do with this body and with this soul. Because guess what? I'm bought with the price. I am not my own. I belong to God. Spirit and soul and body. That's what he, we, we read in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 6, verse 19 and 20, mm -hmm. when we said you were bought with a price. And your body and your, or your spirit and your soul belong to who? God's. They are God's with the apostrophe S, not plural. But they belong to God. Amen? Amen. Our soul no longer is ours unless you're holding on to it. Mm. And we need to let it go. We need to give it over to him. And I guarantee you, that's the best place to be. And in mindset, I'm saying, is when you no longer have to worry about how to live in a world that is causing you to or wanting you to make all kind of crazy decisions. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So, if you are saved, understand this. The devil lost that battle to take your soul. And trust me, there's, the Bible says the, the, the gate is wide to destruction. And many are entering that way. And then he says, and the gate is narrow to eternal life. And few are going that way. So we know that the adversary, if he can convince people to not believe in God, he's got them. Mm. But the ones he didn't get, like me, hallelujah, mm. Sister Yvonne, mm. get your hand up, okay. amen. amen. All y'all out there that's listening, Y'all hope y'all raise your hands and he ain't got me either, Pastor. You know, I belong to God. Amen? Amen. Well, he's lost that battle, but guess what he hasn't lost? He hasn't lost the determination to try to get you 
to make bad decisions, to give up your good fight of faith, even mm -hmm. though you're saved, but not to be used as God's tool, as a witness, or to help somebody else come to know God. See, his whole thing is, if I can destroy your witness, what good are you trying to talk to somebody else when they see yes. your life? Mm -hmm. You can't be an effective witness when you're down here talking about, man, I don't know when I'm going to get through this thing. I, I don't know what happened to God. You can't be saying stuff like that. No, you turn your dialogue around because, again, you know, God gives us what we need when we need it. Amen. That's why we pray, amen, yes. every day. Yes. Lord, direct my thoughts. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, commit your works unto the Lord and he will establish your thoughts. Mm. Established means that they will remain. So you can have thoughts that will come and then they'll go. And if they don't stay, that's not God. Mm. But the thoughts that God put in you, that's why you can't run from it. <laughs> if the right. thoughts that, that stays with you are the thoughts that it's always going to glorify God. So you'll know whether it's an adversary or not because if it's an adversary, it's going to be about you. It's going to be about selfishness. It's going to be like, it'll, it'll be always about what's going to benefit you and not God. Yeah. But when you are, have a thought that you have to make that might benefit you, but also it's going to glorify God, you will not, that thought will not leave you. Mm -hmm. That's why it says, but you have to commit your works, which is what you do. You have to make That's decisions right. that is going to uh, be in line with his will. Not my will, but thy will be done. Yeah. And when you do that, God says, I'm going to give you thoughts that will never leave you until you finish the task. Right? Amen. So, again, he says, matter of fact, I do want you to see this. Go to Job. This is, this is Job when I was saying that he lost the battle for your soul, but he, guess what he hasn't lost? His determination to try to get you to be a bad witness, to give up your faith, and to curse God and die. Mm. Amen? Amen. Look at Job. We're going to look at verses 8 through chapter 1 uh, of Job, verses 8 through 12. And it reads like this. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, and that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? See, see, <laughs> well, let me read this verse, and then I'll tell you what I was just going to say. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Now I can tell you what I was going to say. See, because Satan wanted to get at Job, but God was like, no, you're not touching this one. Job is, is, is a man. He's famous. He's, he's a, a, a man. Uh, what is it called? Uh, he feared God and shuns evil. He's blameless. I love Job because he obeys me. He wants to be used by me to not benefit himself, but bless everybody else. He gave to the widows. He ministers to the, the youth and the children. I mean, they come from all over just to hear him talk. And he would supply needs if there was a need there for, you know, those who are less fortunate, so to speak. Because he had so much, because God blessed him. And he knew it. What he didn't know was that this is not God bringing affliction on him. This was God allowing affliction on him through Satan. And if you read the book of Job, you'll find that he don't understand why God is doing all of this. And, you know, he, but he doesn't know what God and Satan is going on in the dialogue and what God is allowing. Because as you read now, verse uh, 11, Satan says to him, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Satan was trying to get God to do the deed, the dirty work. That's why he says, stretch out your hand. And, 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 and uh, 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 what is this? And, and touch all that he has, and he will, and he says, what is it? And he will surely uh, curse you to your face. But watch what the Lord said. The Lord said, said, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. Person translated being, translated soul. You can do anything you want to do, but you ain't touching his soul. You ain't touching what I gave him and created him in him and put in him. 
Now, if you can get him to change his mind and cause him to make decisions that is not uh, 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 what he's been doing all this time, obeying me and serving me and, you know, all of this, and now you can get him to turn on me, let's see. Now, you got to remember, <laughs> God is what? All-knowing. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. God knew, even at this point, Job ain't going to do what you just said. But you know what? I'm going to show you how awesome I am in allowing this to happen. And I'm going to get more glory because everything you do to Job, Job is not going to turn on me. And he never did. And so at this point, God says, you just can't touch his soul. But it didn't mean that you can't, like in other words, you can't take his soul. You can't take his life. Amen. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can, if you can make Job want to commit suicide, try it. God already knew that that wasn't gonna happen. He, he Job might have had, got discouraged where he wanted to die, mm -hmm. or he got discouraged where he, he said to God, "I wish I was never born." But not one time did Job said, "I'm gonna kill myself," because that's not of God. Mm -hmm. Nothing Job did mm -hmm. was turning on God, even when his wife. Who had the devil in her ear. Because uh, this is a little side note too. And then I'm going to keep going. But did you ever realize that Job lost everything? He lost his, all his family. He had seven sons and three daughters. He had all the wealth. He had all this cattle. He was rich. He was like a king. Okay? Do you know all of that was gone except his wife? And why do you think say? And God didn't say you couldn't. If God allowed him to take his, his, uh, his children... He would allow Satan to take his wife. He said, don't lay a hand on Job's soul or Job's person. But Satan kept his wife there because I need somebody to get in his ear. Who's the one person that can always manipulate a man, a woman? Bathsheba and David? Dave, uh, Delilah and Samson? <laughs> okay. Uh, Adam and Eve? Every one of those women were the ones that got the men to make poor decisions. Amen? And, and the devil's like, hey, I done caused this one to fall. I done caused that one to fall. I done caused... God, I, watch me. You, you going to allow me to go through this? Okay. And he tried it, and even the devil said the same words that Satan said to a husband. Why don't you just curse God and die? It's like, whoa, where'd that come from? Satan said it. It came straight from her, him to her. Now, now, Job didn't know that, but it did, okay? Job's response was, woman, you talk as a foolish woman. Naked I came in this world, and naked I'll depart this world. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You see what I'm saying? So anyway, that was a little side thing. All right, so I wanted to share that with you because I want you to know that though he can't take your soul, he can't touch your soul, he can try to control your soul. And that's why we got to be fed. That's why we got to be prayed up. That's why we got to continuously uh, grow in the knowledge of his wisdom so that when the attack comes, we know exactly what to do. Don't need to fight Satan. You just step back, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. Position yourselves, though, because mm -hmm. the Bible says, go position yourselves, which means take a right position under God mm -hmm. in righteousness. Amen. Make decisions that are in line with God's will, mm -hmm. but don't fight Satan. You're no match for him. Mm -mm. The Spirit of God is. The Lord will rebuke him. Or you can even say, the Lord rebuke you and get out of my face, but don't do it during prayer. Just another little side thing. I, I, I hear people all the time, they'll be praying to God and blessing God. And before they say, in Jesus' name, amen, they turn to Satan and say, and Satan, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You were talking to God. Why are you putting Satan in this conversation? Prayer is a kind of communication between you and God. Now, if you right. want to say the Lord rebuke you after you got through your prayer, and you say in Jesus' name, that might be a little bit more appropriate. But I wouldn't even deal with Satan. Period. Why? God says, I'll fight your battles. You need not to fight. Didn't he say that? You Amen. need not to fight. Amen. The Lord will fight for you. That's all I need to know. I'll step back and say, Lord, show yourself strong. Vengeance Amen. is yours, says the Lord. Amen. Right. Amen. So here we are.
The term sold out, S-O-U-L-E-D, it means basically just like we say sold, S-O-L-D. Because we use that S-O-L-D like, you know, when we're talking about, oh, I'm sold out for, uh, if I'm in the arm, armed forces or in the, in the, in the Navy or, or Marines, whatever. I'm fully in. I'm committed to this task completely. Or if you got a football team that's, that's been your football team forever, or you're on the football team or something, amen? You're sold out, S-O-L-D. You're sold out. You're fully in with that. And God says, and that's what I need you to do with your soul. Be fully in, com mm -hmm. completely. Give it all over to the God, all over to the Lord. Be sold out, S-O-U-L-E-D, because you're sold out. S-O-L-D to God. You hear me? Amen. What are you willing to do with the soul God gave you, says the Lord? Here's the three plague points I want to leave with. Mm -hmm. What are you willing to do with the soul God gave you, says the Lord? Amen? Amen. God says, now that you know what I'm talking about, now that you understand that when you surrendered to me at the altar or whenever you gave your life to Christ, you said, I'm giving my heart. I'm giving you control, Lord. Mm. Jesus, that's why we say, you know, uh, uh, salvation is not just you believe in God. You know, uh, the Bible says, I think it's in Romans 10, 9, where it says, um, um, uh, for salvation, I'm trying to remember the verbatim, but basically what it says is, if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you stop right there, you will be saved. It doesn't say that. It says, if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and make confession, confession that Jesus is Lord, then you'll be saved, the Bible says. Amen. He ties the two of them together. Yes. For with uh, the, uh, the heart one believes unto righteousness. Mm -hmm. The mouth confession is made unto salvation. The heart believes, so you can believe in God, amen? Mm -hmm. But do you make Jesus Lord of your life? Do you confess, which is what you're saying, confession is what's in your heart. Profession is what you know is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like the scripture says, well, if I confess that Jesus is Lord, I'll be saved. I'm going to confess. I'm going to, excuse me, profess. You say and confess, but really, if it's not really truly what you're doing, if you're not making Jesus Lord, if you have not given your soul over and allow the Holy Spirit every day to show you what you need to let go of this day, mm -hmm. amen, regardless of what it is. If you're not there, then you haven't made Jesus Lord. And that confession is really profession. And we're not sure, and I say we, because other Christians might look at you going, I don't know, is he saved or she saved? We can't make that determination. Only God can. Amen? Amen. But we can let you know that in order for you to be truly saved, you have to have the Holy Spirit in you. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you after salvation, and they made their residence in you, and they are the ones in control, then every time you do something wrong, you're convicted. That's right. You cannot tell me, I have not seen in the Bible once, when somebody was following Jesus, and even Peter, you remember? Mm -hmm. Even Judas, amen? Yeah. All of these, that when something they did wrong, they didn't go, oh. They were either remorseful. Matter of fact, the Bible says both Judas and Peter were remor remorseful. Both of them. Mm -hmm. The same word. But one, the Bible says, repented and, and returned to the Lord. And, and the other one was condemned or condemned himself because Satan put it in his head, you need to go hang yourself. He committed suicide. You tell me which one's saved and which one's not saved. The one that condemned himself and went and hung himself or the one that after he realized both of them remorse. And then, mm -hmm. or the one that when he returned, the Bible says, and strengthen the brother when you, brethren, when you get back. And then he went on to, to lead uh, uh, Peter in the last chapter of John 21, where he tells him, basically, feed my sheep. You got work to do, Peter. Amen? Amen. And now Peter understands, like, I messed up, God. I, I'm so sorry. You know, but what do you want me to do? Jesus said, you know, do you love me? Three times. Why do you think you asked him three times, do you love me? Because Peter betrayed him. I mean, yeah, Peter betrayed him, what, three times? 
So he's like, okay, let me see how you like, see how it feels to you, Peter. Because when you said, I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him. And Jesus sitting right there looking at him. You know how that must have hurt Jesus, even though he knew he was going to say it. The Bible says on the third time when he cursed, the Bible says Peter looked up and saw Jesus looking back at him. You know, and that's what really got Peter. Not the fact that he denied him the first two times or even the third time. is when he looked at Jesus and saw Jesus look back and he remembered, oh, he said I was going to do this and I let him down. And he, it took him a while to get over it. But then he got over it, and Jesus said to him, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, I, you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. No, feed my lambs. No, feed my sheep first. Then he asked him a second time, Peter, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know, you, you know I love you. He says, feed my lambs. And then he says, Peter, you, do you love me? Peter's getting irritated now. He's like, Lord, you know all things. <laughs> you know I love you. He said, feed my sheep. And then he went on and gave him some instructions. But I'm saying that... That those three times had been like irritating to Peter because it's like all you had to ask me was once, do you love me? Yeah, I love you. Why are you asking me a second time and a third time? He said, because I want you to feel what I felt. Irritating, isn't it, Peter? <laughs> Amen. Amen. So here it is. What will you do? What are you willing to do with the soul God gave you, says the Lord? Number one, bless the Lord with everything we have, right? Bless the Lord with everything we have. We have number two, your soul is worth more than anything in this life. All right. And number three, and lastly, enjoy you. Enjoy you. Enjoy who God created you to be. Number one, bless the Lord with everything we have. Psalm 103. And we're going to look at verses 1, 2, and then we're going to jump to chapter 104 and verse just one verse. So all together, it's only three verses. Psalm 103. It's, it's a familiar mm -hmm. verse. You, you all are going to recognize it when we get there. Amen. And it reads, 103 verses, um, where am I? 1 and 2. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. In all that is within me, bless his holy name. Number two, verse two. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. See, God is saying, bless him. You know, bless him with everything. He said, not with some of my soul. Bless the Lord with all my soul and all my strength. And then he says, why? Because of all the benefits that he's bestowed upon you. Salvation first. But then everything that he's done for you. When I think about the goodness in the Lord and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out what? Hallelujah. Amen. And I thank God for saving me. That's yes. the scripture that uh, um, talks about, you know, bless the Lord on my soul. Then uh, verse next page, Psalm 104, verse uh, 1. It says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. The psalmist, and I don't know if it's David. Yeah, it's David, the psalm of David. David is just so pleased and glad about who God is, what God has done, and what God is able to do that he just can't contain himself. He just want to bless the Lord with everything that's within him. And when David, y'all remember when David got the Ark of the Covenant back when it was taken from them, when they, they were doing bad things and God gave them over and allowed the Ark to be taken, when he got it back, the Bible says he danced and twirled and whirled right out of his clothes. And he just wanted to praise God. And I'm telling you today that the very first thing we want to do with the will and the soul that God has put in us is when we say we're giving it all over, let's first start by giving him all that is due his name. Let's bless the Lord with everything that's within me. That's right. Our heart, our mind, our soul, our thankfulness, Amen. everything, right? Amen. Number two, your soul is worth more than anything in this life, right? Uh, Mark chapter, 30, uh, chapter 8, Mark, the gospel according to Mark, chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 36 and 37, two verses. Mark chapter 8. 
36 and 37. Your soul is worth more than anything in this life. Look at what it says here. Verse 36. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but yet loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mm. These are the words of Jesus. He says, I don't care about all the stuff, all the material things you might, you know, might gain, that you might uh, accumulate over the years, or you may be even left an inheritance and you're wealthy now. He says, what profit is that if you gain all of this, you get the position, you get the power, and you get the riches of this world, but yet your soul is going to go to hell. What good is it? Not good at all. Mm -hmm. It ain't worth anything. All this stuff is worth is useless. You know what I mean? I've heard of some people that are really, really rich, and when they die, they don't even get their wealth over to uh, the loved ones. They give it all, all of it over to a charity. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I guess they think, well, this is my way of before I go, I'm gonna make some kind of, you know, uh, 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 what do you call it? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna appease God a little bit because I'm giving to, the, I'm giving to the, I'm giving all my wealth over to the charitable, charitable foundations and stuff. It was too late at that point. So you, I hope you were doing that before, not you. I'm just saying this, this parable here. I hope this guy was doing this before he died. Amen. Amen. But then he says, and what will a man give in exchange? For his soul. What on this earth? Look, there's nothing, <laughs> amen, in heaven or earth that's worth bargaining your soul for. Mm. Your soul is what God created you and made you unique. He said, You're fearfully and wonderfully made. He's like, Why would you, if I put this in you, and this is who you are, not what you look like. But this is what I created you. And, and we're going to see something a little bit better than that on the last point. But it's like, do you realize that you are unique? There's, never, there's not another one of you. And everything that I put in you, I put in you for a purpose, a reason, so you could be successful, so you could be prosperous in the spiritual sense. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so that you can glorify me because everything in this world is going to pass away. But what you do for God will be eternal. Whatever it is, kindness, that will go into heaven. Amen? Amen? When you look out for your brethren who stumbled or fell, that's going into heaven. You know, all the things that is, that's making a difference in the kingdom of God's agenda is going into heaven. It will always be there. But the things of this world, he says, why would you exchange your soul for anything that is going to benefit the world? Or benefit you, I'm sorry, of the world. Benefit, you know, you're gaining some things from the world, but it ain't going to benefit you in heaven. Why would you do that? So, number two is, your soul is worth more than anything in this life. Treat your soul as the, pro as the most precious part of who you are. That's worth. No, yeah. Treat yourself. With, let me say that again. Treat yourself as the most precious part of you. Not your flesh. Amen. Mm -hmm. Not what you look like. But your soul. Guard your heart with all diligence, the Bible says. Your heart is housed. It's part of your soul makeup. And God says Amen. guard it. Protect it. With all diligence. Mm -hmm. Beware. Lest the adversary get in there and start messing with your head. Trying to manipulate you. So that you make determinations. Based on uh, what you're feeling. Your emotion done kicked in. Because yeah. he, he done done something to hurt you. Or you had a stronghold from when you was a baby. That got stronger and stronger. And you still haven't been delivered from that. And he keeps reminding you. That you're not worth something. Or that. Others are going to always win when it comes to you or them. They're always going to win. You're always going to be the loser. You're never going to be good enough. Mm. That's a stronghold that if you were like that when you grew up, it only got bigger until you get delivered. And that's what he has in his arsenal to try to get you to make decisions so he can control who you are, not the flesh, but who you are on the inside. Yeah. 
Lastly, enjoy you. Oops, excuse me. Enjoy you. Amen. 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 Psalm 139. I know that's my, my dear sister over there. One of her favorites. I know it's one of mine. But uh, it's, I'm not even going to read the part that, that, that is a blessing because to me all of Psalm 139 is a blessing. I'm just going to read this first verse which really <laughs> has nothing to do with my point. I just love verse 1 of Psalm 39. 139 is this, Oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Mm -hmm. I just want to share that with you because God knows everything about you. This is a past tense scripture. He says, you have searched me and known <laughs> me. That's, right. That's not God is search God, you're searching me and you're coming to know me. He said, no, remember before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. God says, I know everything about you. I know your life. I know where, what you, every decision you're going to make. I knew that Abraham was going to lift that knife and sacrifice his only son. I knew that. And, and the scripture that says, right after that, now, you know, Abraham, Abraham, lay not a hand on the, on the child or on the lad. For now, God knows that you will not withhold anything. That scripture didn't mean that God didn't know. That scripture means God had an experience with Abraham. See, God gives glory. What is glory for God? Joy. What is glory is when his people operate by faith and he can now feel and see and have, remember, he's emotional like us. And so he can experience that emotion of, look at my, my son. He was going to obey me and kill the only son that him and uh, Sarah, I promised, was going to have. Ishmael was not the promise. Isaac was. And God says, and now I'm able to experience it. I knew he wasn't going to, I knew he was going to do it. That's why I had already had the ram in the bush waiting on him. But I wanted Abraham, and Abraham knew that he was going to do it because he said in Hebrews that, you know, if I'm going to kill him, God, you must going to raise him up because you said, you know, in Isaac, all the seed, in my seed, Isaac, all the nation is going to be blessed. How is he going to be blessed if Isaac is dead? So, okay, I'm going to kill him. You're going to raise him up. Okay, I'm good with that. And God says, that was a two-win thing. Abraham showing his faith and me getting glory. But, he says, enjoy you. So now let's get to the part that I wanted to share with you. 130, Psalm 139. Let's look at verse 13 through 16. 13, it says, God... You form, for you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. Why? Because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. See, see, enjoy who God created you to be. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Let me, let me just keep going to show you how awesome you are with the soul that God put in you. Watch this. Marvelous are your works. He's talking about himself. <laughs> okay? This is uh, uh, a psalm of David. David is saying to God, marvelous are the work of your hands. Look at what you've done in me. Watch this. And that my soul knows very well. See, David is saying to God, look, I'm giving the accolades because of what you've done to create me. And I know you did it. It was you. It was your hands that created me to be who I am. You better enjoy you. You better recognize that you are unique, Amen. you are special, and that God has put Amen. in you something that nobody else has. Everybody has a soul, but nobody has the same soul. So if you are of a certain personality, you have a certain way of, of doing things, you know, whatever God put in you, it's going to come out. You probably have been using it your whole life and didn't know that that was God's way of putting in you you, your uniqueness for him. Watch this. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. He says, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Last verse. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book they are all, they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. David's like, before I was even thought of, before I was even brought into this world, I was already written in your book, 
And I was already formed in the spirit. And it says here, the days were fashioned for me. Enjoy you. Enjoy who God created mm -hmm. you to be. Amen. Allow your personality, your soul, to bless you. Amen? Amen. God made you with precision. That's what he's talking about right here. He says, skillfully. What? He fashioned the days. I mean, it's, it's like everything God did. My frame wasn't hidden from you. He says, uh, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. God took time with you just like he took time with Adam in putting in him what he wanted Adam to be. And then he blessed him just like he blessed us. And that's why when we come out and we name the natural from what the spiritual uh, birth was going to be, and then we grow up and we give the spiritual or we get born again so we have the spiritual birth again, then when we give our whole soul over to God, that's when we're really selling out to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Do I have two minutes? Mm -hmm. I want to share this conversation I had with this uh, manager on my job. And uh, I shared this with my boss earlier today. He says, man, that is an awesome. That is awesome. Because this person happened to see on my phone a picture of my wife. And she said, oh, I'm going to tell your wife. I said, <laughs> I went back to it. I said, that is my wife. And she's like, oh, she's gorgeous. I said, yeah. And I even told her age. I ain't going to tell y'all. But I even told her age. And then I told her my age. And she says, can you move, remove your mask? So I removed my mask just so she could see my whole face. And she says, are you Chinese? Because obviously, I guess she's saying that Chinese know how to eat well and do things, exercise, whatever. And they look young a lot longer <laughs> than, I guess, the older they get. You can't tell how old they are. And uh, she said, I said, no, no, no. I said, but this is who God made me. I was able to bring up God, you know. And I said, I'm somebody that when God created me, this is what I told her. When God created me, he made me to not worry. He made me to have joy. My wife calls me, oh, here comes the happy guy, right? Because that's who God made me. He made me to be like this. And I said, I don't let things worry me. I don't let things bother me. I said, uh, I keep my joy and I keep my peace. And I said, and that's what makes up a healthy way of uh, looking, you know. That's who I am on the inside. It just, it just is reflection on the outside now, you know, but that's it, you know. And I wanted to share that because, again, she saw the outward. And I'm trying to explain to her the inward. God made me so that I could look like this, so I could be like this. Amen? Amen. Join me. And, and being sold out by giving all of yourself over, excuse me, over to the Lord. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father God, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I just want to put a plea out there uh, that you would touch the hearts of all those that might not have surrendered their total soul over to you. And I pray that, Lord, only you know who they are and only you know how to reach them. And so I pray, or we pray, Lord God, that mm -hmm. you would touch them and lead them to yourself. Draw them by your spirit. If they're not saved, Lord God, just let them know that all it takes is faith by grace. Your grace and their faith to get them into the kingdom of heaven by believing that you raised Jesus from the dead according to your scriptures and also confess that Jesus is Lord. And all that means is that you are surrendering or they will be surrendering everything in their heart, mind, soul, strength. In Jesus' name, I thank you for this message. And I pray you seal it in our hearts until we come together again. In Jesus' name, we pray. And let the church say amen. Amen. amen.